Hey, we want to welcome you to Roots. It's been a long time coming, planning. Yes, it has been. And uh, this has been something that's been on our hearts for a while. But but what's interesting is is we're not new to podcasting, if that's the term nowadays. Because way back when, we did a podcast probably 12 years ago. Even more than that, more than that. Like, we got to give a shout out to Joseph and Heba Taylor. Yeah. They were on the cutting edge back then. Yeah, and, they were. And uh, that was our first podcast that we did in the context of the International House of Prayer with um, with One Thing. Yeah. And uh, we had probably 4,000, I think it was, people. No, there, it was up to 10,000 way back when. Really? Yeah. Okay. Crazy. And so uh, so how this how, how did this begin? It began with us just talking about what the Lord has done in our lives and where we've been and the journey that we've been on and went, wait a sec, I think we have something to, to share because we, I, I feel like we kind of figured life out a lot on our own. Absolutely. And, and so Absolutely. now we're like, let's let's be a guide, let's be a coach, let's help people, and let's give perspective that's real, that's you know kind of authentic, and we're just gonna we're gonna tell it like it is, so to speak. And I think what how some of this actually came about was in um, March, just as quarantine twenty twenty was hitting. Yeah. Um, you know, Jennifer and I were having a conversation and just, you know, just Jennifer's calling before the Lord. Oh, you and wanted to share that story. I want to go there. Sorry, you go there then. <laughs> it's just, I think, um, you know, we've been married coming up how many years, Jen? 29, babe. I knew that. I was going to say that. So yeah. we've been what, coming what up day? 20, August 17th. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> so um, it's just... Uh, I believe in Jennifer's calling. I believe that she has a message to speak. And so we were having a conversation and I'm going, you know, we've just moved back to the States, um, you know. A year ago today. Okay, don't tell people, but yeah, oh my gosh, that's crazy. (laughs) So we're having this conversation and I'm like, Jennifer, I think let's just begin slowly and get you kind of postured and started back in the States here. Because, you know, when you leave a country, um, it's just natural. Yeah. Our relationships that we had in ministry when we, all of those things just, you know, kind of dried up for lack of a better term. And we went, spent six years, amazing years in, in Brazil. And mm-hmm. and so she's like, no, let's do it together. So we had this, you know, Chloe, our middle daughter would say an hour long do- argument about it. And, and I like us together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I do too. Yeah, that was really, really convincing, Dwayne. So I'm trying to get to my point. You keep interrupting okay, me. Okay, go. Sorry, so dear. So I, I was like, no, I, I, I believe that you're supposed to do this. So the strange thing that happens, strange thing happens is the next morning, I'm sitting on the couch early in the morning. I'm just talking with the Lord, and mm-hmm. and I just feel like I'm supposed to look up DwayneAndJennifer.com. Right. And I had tried to buy Dwayne and Jennifer Cup. Dot com. I think even a couple times, but but it was never available. Right. And so I just, you know, that morning I just, you know, went to GoDaddy and boom, um, dollar ninety nine. Come on, we're and we're so, on we're on sale. <laughs> and so I just felt that little nudge from the Lord that we're supposed to do something together. Yeah. And so we, Jennifer and I, I love branding and marketing and ideas, and so. I'm 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 leading us in a conversation and what are we going to call this? Right. And 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 what are we going after? Right. What are we aiming for? And what is the purpose? And right. and I don't like things that are done without without that in mind. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Uh-huh. And so that for me was something in the beginning of our conversation that sure. I felt was important. Yeah. And so um we just started talking and I got my yellow pad out and just started <laughs> writing down everything. Right. And you were the one that came up with the name. What was the logic behind it? Well, we Roots, just uh, Roots, the Unseen Life. So yeah. Roots and then the Unseen Life is the tagline. Um, because I feel like culture is shifting. Life is turbulent. Things yeah. are always changing. And the roots that no one sees is what stabilizes a tree. Yeah. And I feel like... We have been on a journey of the Lord establishing roots in our lives. Yeah. And 
and that's not an easy process. And it's actually not one you see because mm -hmm. it's below the surface. Mm -hmm. And the things that are below the surface are the things that actually stabilize you. And so to me, roots, the unseen life, that's what we want to build. I want to build it in myself. I want to help build it in my children. I want to build it in this generation. I want to build it in the nations that the roots get established, those things that people cannot see that'll sustain them for decades. And when you look at, um, cause you know, we don't see the roots. Right. We only see the fruit right. in a person's life, right. whether it's a strong tree with lots of fruit or uh -huh. if it's a struggling tree and no fruit. Right. That's all we see. Or, or a tree that's been um, pruned. In that's any, painful. In, in any stage, though, yeah. the root system is essential. Yeah. And that's the part that we want to focus on. So we're, we're going to touch on theology. Mm -hmm. I, I love theology. We're going to interview a lot of people. Yeah. Um, on we're going to tell our story. And in the context, though, but also not only th theology and our story and how the Bible has, has walked that out, but also I want to talk about just those emotional side to our lives uh -huh. how do, what's the importance of emotions yeah and 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 how do i how do i navigate with un, those those emotional th my emotions that are unseen but yet right. have such an impact right. uh, we're going to talk a lot of on truth yeah um and 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 then i want to talk a lot about biblical success and the importance yeah. of being rooted in truth mm -hmm. and in biblical ideas that mm -hmm. help me have much fruit, yeah. you know? Um, and so we're going to cover a ton of topics. Um, I realize very much that we're not the experts on many things. Right. <laughs> but we know a lot of people that are. But we're just, over the years, we've just got some unbelievable rich relationships. Yeah. And so I don't know what the percentage will be, but I want to interview a lot of people yeah. that, that'll that help just bring understanding, clarity, and right. richness to people's lives. Right. Um, a lot of people that have walked the journey that have a root system. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've got... We're just so blessed with many friends that have so much to say, and and I want to I want to go after the controversial topics, sexuality, um, you know, politics, all of these things where we can bring in people with wisdom, experience, and understanding. Mm -hmm. But but I just think that storms are coming. Yeah, we're launching this in 2020 in the midst of I A think pandemic. unprince unprecedented challenges on yeah. the earth. We've yeah. never had stuff like this before. Right. And I'm not a doom and gloom guy, but I am saying that now more than ever, what is in the, my root system is going to help stabilize me. And we yeah. have to talk about this stuff. Yeah, I agree. We we definitely need to talk about it. We need to talk about the, the things that are disruptive to our culture and even difficult to maneuver as a believer. Because it is the the way of Jesus is narrow, and that leads to everlast, everlasting life. But but broad or the the opinion of the masses yes. leads to destruction. Yeah. And so, how do we walk that straight and narrow line of biblical conviction? Not narrow-mindedness that we're stupid and right, ignorant, right. but biblical conviction that causes you to go the same direction of truth, and you don't change your conviction because there's a lot of pressure that came at you. Yeah. And th and that's hard to do. Really hard. It, it's, it's really hard to do. Yeah. And it feels like there's an evolution of thought because of cultural pressure. And often, or, or what I'm seeing is people are changing their biblical conviction based on cultural pressure. And that is dangerous and scary. That it's that, not easy to stand firm with that kind of pressure, but that's what we're called to. And that's where the opinions that we hold um, are they rooted in the in the Word? Are they yeah. rooted in truth? Mm -hmm. Because when I encounter somebody who I like, who's kind, mm -hmm. who's mm -hmm. perhaps more loving than other Christians I know but yet their opinions 
and their convictions are anti-biblical, mm-hmm. where will I stand? Right. And I want, they're a nice person. Yeah. And uh-huh. I want to I want to wrestle through these issues. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm I'm excited about this. And you guys, this is, you know, we just both just entered our fifties. And so this is this is something I'm 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 passionate yeah. about is helping this next generation. Um, those, you know, of all ages, actually, we really are, are feel a, we want to talk to, but this is a unique season and a unique time. And more than ever, I believe we've got to focus on yeah. roots. Yeah, I agree. So, so Jennifer, let me ask you a question. Yes, Dwayne, please. <laughs> hey, we're, um, I want to. What tell- do I love about you? Is that what you were going to ask? No, but it, it wouldn't hurt if you'd tell me that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll save it for Valentine's Day, babe. <laughs> okay. What, uh, tell me, tell me, uh. Tell me, slash those that are, are with us, a little bit of your story. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I So my story, just brief, um, briefly, sorry, is I was born in California outside of uh, San Francisco. My parents were hippies. What year would this be? This would be 1969, Dwayne. So cultural back then. I mean, you're, we're, it's I mean, it's, the Summer of Love what? happened. Summer of Love was 1967. Okay, so two years so, later. R- but my parents were in all of that. I mean, it was crazy town. They were living in the Haight Ashbury district in San Francisco. Um, my my dad meets my mom. She was a single mom, had five sons that were basically a year apart. So crazy. I mean, my mom's life would have been really crazy. She had recently gotten divorced. Her um, husband was a heroin addict and a wife beater, like terrible, terrible abuse that she endured to the point that she's deaf in one ear and only has 30% of her hearing in the other. Today, right? Today. So she meets my dad, who's hippie pacifist, you know, love, happy. He's very philosophical. I love my dad. I love talking to him. He's just super, super interesting. Um, I I agree. Yeah. So they get pregnant with me and then they get married. And then my dad adopts all of my brothers. And so, but when he's, he's there, I'm three months old. Um, he gets a telephone call from his parents in Seattle where he was raised saying, Hey, we need you to come and turn yourself in because my dad had been arrested for, for drugs and fled to San Francisco and, you know, chilling amongst the hippies and his parents put their house up for bond. So if he doesn't come back and turn himself in, they're going to lose their house. So just wait. So we're living in a day and age now where pot is legal in that state. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you can buy it. And he went to, pre- he, okay, he got, sorry. So was, he was convicted. He had a six inch marijuana plant and some pot seats. That's yeah, it. And that's it. That's and he, it. And it was a felony at the time. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison. So when you moved to, so that you moved to a Shelton, Washington. Right, because where that's the where the state, state penitentiary, penitentiary was. was. <laughs> and, we, and then we stayed, because why not? And so how old were you when, we, when, you, when you moved there? I was uh, three months old. So three months old. So mm-hmm. you have no recollection of this, of course. No, I but... do. I've, it's vivid in my mind. Vivid. <laughs> so your dad goes to prison. Yeah, goes to prison. For 15 years. Yeah. Okay. And so then... All so my bro- mom's going to be a single mom now of six children. For 15 for years. For 15 years. My gosh. That's yeah. just insane. It's crazy. Insane. So um, fortunately, the law changed while he was in prison, and he got out after 15 months. So he, I was 18 months old when my dad got out of prison. And then so we, you have no recollection of that either? No. Okay. No, I, I, I don't. I mean, I'm told stories, but I don't remember them. I, rem, I don't remember nothing. I'm told that I didn't like it when he came home because I was sharing a bed with my mom and okay. he took my spot. Gotcha. So I would get in bed and kick him in the back and stuff, try to get him out, <laughs> which that's kid, you know. Totally. So anyway, so he's out of prison now. Um and our, our lives are just crazy. You know, my parents were doing the best they could. They were, um, you know, still kind of had the hippie mentality. I had some amazing, fun memories of being raised in the family that I was raised in. Very loose, high, and free. I, I mean, just can't imagine. You know, I dance parties. I remember the dance parties. Putting on my mom's go-go boots and her sizzler. The sizzler is this, like, super short, shimmery dress. And I'm like... 
four years old with my mom's go-go boots and and a, a sizzler dress, and oh I'm dancing gosh. on the table, and everyone's cheering, and I mean it was just. <laughs> I mean it was a party. It was a party. There were some and, fun. And things. you being an Enneagram Seven, loved yeah. it. Oh, lived the party. And you were the center of the party. Oh yeah, I mean I was the family toy for a, a length of time until I wasn't, and that's another story. But um, so no. I mean, you're still very much a hippie family. Yeah, Loose, yeah. high, and free. Loose, high, and free. My mom w- so, wasn't wearing shoes still. So how about a bra? Uh, no, no. <laughs> we started wearing a bra around the same time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, All so right, there's then. that. Okay. Um, so talk about, I mean, you've just told me stories. So talk about sitting around and your mom talking about pot, marijuana. Yeah. So their philosophy was kids are going to do drugs, so it's best to just do them in the home. And um, I had smoked pot with some neighborhood kids, you know, I'm like 10. And I've smoked pot, you know, maybe four or five times. And my mom catches wind of it and says, hey, I would prefer you wait until you're 14. And this is something we could do together. Wow, that's a little bit different than my (laughs) home, but we're going to get to that. (laughs) Yeah, we'll get to that. And so I was like, okay, yeah, I'll wait, you know, whatever. Um, So crazy, you know. Family background's crazy. And my parents um, would go to an Episcopal Episcopal church on occasion. Um, My dad was raised Greek Orthodox, and he was never anti-faith at all. Um, But, I, you know, definitely not a follower of Jesus. Right. um, But a religious person and philosophical. And he loved the Greek Orthodox Church with the incense and the icons and the whole experience was so um, sensual, not in a sexual way, but, you know, in a... Se- I mean, it, your senses your are awakened. Senses you are... smell, you touch, you taste, all of that. And that is, that is that's my dad. I mean, he's just all in. He embodies a lot. You know, he wants to experience. He's very artistic. Yeah. Excuse me, artistic. So they would go to the Episcopal Church, because in our small town, 7,620 of Shelton, Washington, (laughs) um, there was no Greek Orthodox Church. And so um, he would go to the Episcopal Church, and there's a little bit of incense and, you know, some of the saints on the wall. And um, so they went there a few times. I mean, I had memories of going to church a couple times a year. My dad would say, hey, Jen, watch my Adam's apple. When I go up for communion, it's going to go down twice. (laughs) So my dad was like, tip the the priest's hand to try to get a little more wine and, you know, watch his Adam's apple go down twice. You know, we were poor. So, hey, that's your free shot of wine. Um, So we did that a few times. But just I'm I'm 15 and my, my parents get invited to a church that meets in the Episcopal Church at night. So it's it's not the Episcopal Church. It's another church that runs the building. And so they go to church. I'm 15. They go to church, and they get saved that night. So I remember them coming home. Hey, we got saved. And I'm like, was there a fire? I mean, I had no grit. That language didn't mean anything well, to I, you. Like, I had no idea what they were talking about like saved saved from what right right and even my dad talking about the cross i'm like you mean the necklace i just totally totally unchurched no grid for what they were talking about and so you know i had my parents said i turned out good because i rebelled and went straight so i got good grades in school i did sports i was into you know um i was a class president of my junior high those kinds of things which every other parent wanted for their child and my parents were like really you're going corporate you know just <laughs> very different very different very different and so they wanted me to go to church. I was babysitting, you know, the people that I babysat for, they were in the bowling league because that's what you did in Shelton. You went to Friday night football games or you went to the bowling alley on Saturday night. So that's that. And so I remember thinking this could really ruin my reputation. You know, I really, oh yeah. It was just like, I had made it. In terms of my worldview, I was popular, I was getting good grades, I had these elements of success, and if I embraced religion, that could be quite a deficit to my reputation. And so had that thought process of, I don't know if this is the way I want to go. Yeah. And so 
Uh, but they wanted me to go and invited me, invited me, invited me. So I eventually went. And I remember, um, I mean, I'm walk, I walk into the church and it's the 80s. My hair's big. I got the plastic earrings, round plastic, <laughs> massive awesome. earrings. <laughs> totally. I had starched my collar straight up. I had my white pumps on to match my white plastic jewelry. I mean, I was, I was 80s deck, big hair the whole bit. Um, and I walk in and I, I wasn't expecting what I experienced. I, I experienced the presence of the Lord. I didn't know that's what it was. I didn't have I language the, for it. I love this story. But I remember being drawn, like something felt warm and safe and cozy. Yeah. And I'm being drawn to this. But then all of a sudden I feel this disconnection, like a brick wall. And I'm like, ah. And now I know that's my sin. You, yeah. you get drawn, but your sin is a barrier. That's why we needed Jesus to pay the debt so we had access to him. You know so, what I mean? Yeah. So it's that wrestle. And so I'm... I'm feeling the presence and I'm, and then there's a brick wall and it's like a repeated cycle. And, and, and then I, I'm freaking out. I'm disrupted for the first time in my life. I don't know what's going on. I had always been so confident and now I'm trembling on the inside, have no idea what I'm experiencing. I go into the bathroom, I cry and put my makeup back on and cry and, you know, like six, seven, eight times go to the bathroom just because I'm so disrupted. Later, after I get saved, the youth pastor, his description of me was, you look like you were just way too cool to be in this service. And I'm like, you have no idea. I was shaken by the presence of God. Wow. And so long story short, you know, I end up going to youth group, trying it out because I felt like I needed to be true. If this was real, I needed to say yes to it. If it wasn't real, at least I gave it a fair shot. Yep. And so I went to youth group multiple times. I'm totally unchurched. We have to read the Bible sometimes together in the, in the little youth group service. And they would give a scripture. I don't even know how to read a scripture. Like, you know, Revelation 4 dot dot 8. I don't know what that means. I don't no. need that. I don't know that four is the chapter and eight is the verse. I just don't know anything. So totally unchurched. Totally unchurched. So when I have to, that's read, different from my Bible sword days. Right? Yeah, up. you're a Bible sword guy, <laughs> and I'm given the Book of Revelation. Someone hands me a Bible. I'm supposed to read it, and. I mean, this huge book of the Bible, book of, Re I thought the Bible was the book. What totally, do you mean? Totally, Revelation? Totally. I don't get it. And so one guy says, hey, it's the last bit in the Bible. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. So just that's how unchurched I was. So I got saved when I was 16 and it, it changed my life. I... I remember feeling the love of God for the first time, feeling known, feeling embraced, feeling cared for, feeling centered, uh, and, and the feeling of my sin being forgiven. Like, I don't know how this works theologically. I just know that I remember I felt like I had a backpack on with 300 kilos or, or you know, 600 pounds, and it got removed. And that wow. was my sin being taken away. I remember that moment vividly and weeping in the presence of the Lord, feeling his love. Now that I went on to being a crazy zealot and did a lot of things wrong and a lot of things right. But so that's my background. Yeah. It's you know crazy. what I mean? Crazy. Yeah. And so talk about your background because we had very different childhoods. Yeah. My, I mean, you know, very, very different homes we, we grew up in. So my, you know, I was born in 1968, Calgary, Canada. Um, my my family were uh, was my dad was a pastor, yeah. and so just had a very my different... dad was a logger. <laughs> I had a very different background. So, uh, born in Calgary, Canada, born you know born and raised in the church. Yeah. Um, my brother said, you know, my my brother led me to the Lord. He was scared I was going to go to hell. Uh huh. So it was at summer camp. I gave my life to the Lord at six. So I was, I was born and raised in that environment. Yeah. Um, something that was, I think, when I look back, extremely important to my life was uh, at at six years old, we moved to Africa for two years. Yeah. So I was, um, we lived in, it used to be called uh, Rhodesia, uh -huh. but it's now called, uh, you know, Zimbabwe. And so we lived there for two years. 
and we were missionaries there. My dad took, um, stepped in for two years as a pastor and led a Bible school there. Mm -hmm. And I have many memories from that season of my life, and I believe that season of my life would be that opened me yes, up. Yes, yes. And it, I've never been the same, I think, in regards to my worldview. And now that's impacted me. I've lived in, counting Africa, I've lived in six countries. Yeah. For, and the shortest was two years, which was Africa. Right. And so I Africa's had... Africa's a continent, what do you mean? <laughs> okay, thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> so Just it, helping. But that's, um, you know, and so I was raised in the Christian environment all my life, right. you know, born and raised. So I did the youth group. I did church. Back in the day, we would do church twice on Sundays. Yeah, you'd you have did. the morning service and the evening service. And so raised in all of that. Right. Um, one thing that I, you know, my parents massively I'm grateful for is they really did teach me a hunger for God. Yeah, yeah. And that was very, very important in my life, was just that hunger for God. Which they still possess today. Yeah. I mean, my mom's passed away. Right. But, but my dad, you know, my dad's now 84, and uh, I want to be have that desire to learn and yeah. grow and, and continue that all my life. Yeah. And my dad... It's been an they, excellent example. And they instilled that into me, you yeah. know, that hunger. Um, you know, we I had definitely a lot of religion in me. Um, religious activity that was very much formative. Sure. You know, that how do I relate to God? I can't say that I had a lively relationship with God. But you had a you had the fear of the Lord on you from an Absol- early age. For sure. Absolutely. And that's where it's just, you know, our lives were very different. I think something that marked my life probably pretty significantly would be um, just I had a couple of people prophesy over me. Yeah. That set me on a very different course, right. and it captured me. Yes. And just talking about the call of God on my life and the call of God in the context of ministry. Yeah, well, and and, and one of them being Paul Kane. Yeah, I mean, he was, it was so crazy. My parents were, you know, we had a couple interactions with Paul Kane back in the day, and he, he, him and his um, back then. So, if you don't know Paul Kane, he's quite he has quite a prophetic history. And just being well known for being crazy accurate, and he really, he really prophesied into my life a couple of times. And one of them was he called out my parents in a meeting of like, I don't know, two thousand people or something. And he talked, he called them out, but he talked to them about me. Right, which is crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. And so, where about I, your leadership call and, and that kind of a thing, and just what the Lord breathed on. I mean, what the Lord put into my heart was yeah. just this calling of pursuing ministry, of being called to ministry. And that really kind of had massively positive impact. But yeah. as you guys get to hear our story through this, I'll I'll share of how it also wasn't helpful sure. in me walking, walking out and kind of make, but it actually for sure guided my decision-making yes. process. You were focused from a young age. Yeah. And, and my personality is to live focused and be passionate, but um, that, that absolutely totally shaped yeah. us, yeah. you know. And so, um, let's 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 quickly talk about where we met. Yeah. Um, I was a professional downhill skier. Yeah, and I was a um, figure skater. And so that brought us together in the 1988 Winter Olympics in Calgary, my city. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> we say that, and people believe us for a split second until they. Until and then they, they look at my body and go, oh, "I don't <laughs> think so." <laughs> So her church came to do outreach at the 1990, 1988. 1988 Winter Olympics. And My that's, last year in high school, that's, baby. That's where we met. Yeah. And then uh, just kind of quickly fast forward. We both, she t- I was going to go to do YWAM, Youth with a Mission, in Hawaii. And she told me a sellout. She was going to do Youth with a Mission in Amsterdam Hall. And right. Where, where, the, where they really need missionaries. Where, yeah, you had prostitutes and drug addicts. And you were talking about the righteous beaches of Hawaii. I'm like, <laughs> hello, compromiser. Long story short, we both go there as singles. We're only friends at the time. Totally. Because I, um, I thought boys were just a total distraction. We end up back there. Yeah. And... Uh, both on staff now. And so um, it took me a long time to conquer her heart. She wasn't quite sure about, you know, just life. Her parents were just getting a divorce. Yeah. 
And so, you know, just getting divorced and you going, I don't even know if I want to get married. And right. so we had a lot to work through. But praise the Lord, man. I The Lord brought brought me to you. and You've I'm, been the greatest gift in my life. Yeah, it's been you as well to me. It's been an amazing journey. And so, long story short... So we were there roughly six years. Yeah, long story out, short, we spent there. a little time in Seattle. Then we moved, officially moved back as a married couple and, and spent another four years, I guess it would be, mm-hmm. on staff at Youthwood in, in Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. And I, it was amazing. Um, you know, it's just those years of exp- exploration. Who am uh-huh. I? What am I good at? What am I not right. good at? Right, All of those years, you know. Yeah, and, and, you know, just maybe this is carnal, but my goodness, what an amazing city. It's and, fully carnal, but it's an amazing city. And a fun, thriving social life in our 20s. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just fun. Uh, So much fun. I mean, you you know, for those of you who've been to Amsterdam and those who are listening that live in Amsterdam, you got an amazing city. I love it. It's It's my favorite city on the earth. I mean, it's full of sin. You know, it's notorious for its sin. Right. But it's also just the canals at night. Yeah, the architecture. The the coffee, it's amazing. Yeah, it was fun. But, But... I had been doing my job for a while, uh-huh. and I was discontent. Yes. And Jennifer's like, speaking of roots, she wants to root into Amsterdam, and I'm like, I'm a little bit bored. We've been doing discipleship training schools for a while. Long story short, um, a guy gets up, prophesies over us, and says, uh, Dwayne's leadership gift, it's going to be like a new pair of shoes. They're going to hurt, but the Lord wants to develop you in this. Right. So long story short, where did we go? We went to Budapest, Hungary. So what year is this? 94? 94. So it's post-communism, but really, barely. barely. And so it was, we went with a um, couple other, one other couple, and then a lot, a whole bunch of singles and, and moved to Budapest, Hungary. Yeah. Kind of pioneered. We Post communism. Yeah, pioneering a YWAM base. We weren't the first staff members no, there. No, we came about six months after the first group had moved. But it was just, it was crazy. It was man. crazy. Just but, moving in and pioneering something. And it was our first taste of pioneering. Right. And it was fun. There were some aspects that were super fun. We loved just dreaming and thinking about what could be yeah. and how to make it happen. And, and Budapest is a beautiful city. And our, our oldest know. daughter was born there. I mean, that's yeah. a whole other story. Hysterical. <laughs> so that, and again, so we, this is now entering into the Balkans war. Uh-huh. So we lived there dur- during some of that season as well. And so we went down to former Yugoslavia, down right down into Croatia. Uh-huh. Sarajevo, Sarajevo where was one of the true hot spots. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Belgrade, Romania, Bucharest, all of these Albania, cities. Albania, parts of Greece, yeah. And so that w- those were just incredible season. But it's where um, we both, but where for me, I had a crisis. Yeah. And it was... Um, we had been at that point, we had led teams to 35 countries. Yeah. So we... Or been on a team at least. We've traveled a ton um, through that. And I, I ran into a little bit of a crisis there in my late 20s, yep. 28, 29 years old. Just something's not right with what I'm doing. Yeah. The fruit that I longed for, you read John 15, the fruit that will glorify the Father, it wasn't there. Yeah. And so that was hard on me. We could write a great newsletter and we saw amazing things, but the 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 longevity of what we did, it seemed like we would, you know, plant a church and go back in six months and the church wasn't there anymore. Yeah. And so there was the... And so we were disillusioned with ministry. We I'd were say. disillusioned with ministry. And then also just, I, you know, both of us, but particularly me, I disillusioned with my life in God. Yeah. So, you know, just... There had to be Speaking more. of roots, I was I truly felt like I was an inch deep. And yeah. I just I I I loved the spirit, but I was truly lacking in the Bible. I I did not yet love my Bible at that point in my life. And so long right. story short, uh, through God speaking very powerfully, like the first time where God sp- I mean, we met a guy, I'll give you the quick story. We meet a guy, I introduce myself. As du- hey, I'm Dwayne, and he goes, "Wow, you're Dwayne." I, the Lord woke me up two weeks ago in the middle of the night and gave me your name, and He then just said, "There's a freshly plowed field. You're going to be planted there, 
and you're going to have deep roots and have much fruit. The fruit you've always longed for. The fruit you've always longed for. And so that guy in that prophetic word, that relationship was actually what shifted us to uh, Kansas City in 1998. Yeah. And uh, so... So out of left field. It was like, what in the world? You know, we're living in beautiful Budapest, Hungary, amazing architecture, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're moved to Kansas City, living on an off ramp in the middle like of that. Missouri. It's like, what just happened? What just happened? And Kansas City was not as cool back then. No, Trust now me. it's super cool. It's and it's actually a fun place we to were go. just there last weekend. It's an amazing city, but that was not the case. No, not at all. So we are we hanging out there. And we think we're going to be there for a year, and then we're going to figure out how to go back into missions with church planting and, and feeling like it's not so much feeling like our problem is we've been working um, with a parachurch, parachurch organization. organization, and we now want to work with a church. And, yeah. and so long story short, we moved there in August 98. Mike Bickle starts teaching on uh, this thing called a house of prayer in January of 99. It opens May and our lives are turned upside down. So many things are making sense. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. We were, we joined staff and, you know, we were the very first staff members, which yeah. is crazy. We didn't even know we were participating. So, yet. and back then there was interns and all of that. So it just wasn't Mike Bickle and Dwayne and Jennifer, but no, let's a- let's go down the history. It was us. <laughs> if it wasn't for us, the place wouldn't exist, right? Yeah. Let's let's <laughs> let's do that narrative. <laughs> yeah. So there was lots of people involved, but you know, when I look at I, those days, I will never forget them. Right. And uh, um, cl- without a doubt, two things that now mark my life yep. that I learned. Mm-hmm. So this is now I'm like 30, 31 years old. The two things that have now now are foundational values of my life that I was learning back then was my Bible. Yeah. Uh, when Mike Bickle would teach the Bible, it was like it would come alive. And yeah. I had not been under that type of ministry before. Right. And then the second thing was, is I learned how to pray. Yeah. Yeah. And I did not have a life of prayer. I, right. You know, living in our 20s, I had amazing newsletters. Lots of activity, but I did not know how to talk to God, and I did not know how to quiet myself so God would talk to me. Yeah, and I would say, like, I I knew about intimacy with Jesus before that, for sure, and it had been my lifestyle. Absolutely, way more than me. But but I had quickly switched the order of the first and second commandment. Yeah. And, you know, when you're involved in ministry, you see the needs of the masses and the many yeah and you go there quickly totally and and ihop international house of prayer it reminded us again that we needed to sit at the feet of jesus and more would be accomplished through prayer than was ever accomplished through action absolutely and it doesn't mean you don't do action but we got we got that system uh fixed in terms of sit with him. Strength comes to those who wait on the Lord. There was so many things and and this is this is the season we're going to talk to you a lot about yeah. in the future. Yeah. Like paradigm shifted, yes. confronted, my sin confronted. Yeah. Divine love encountered. Um, oh, the satisfaction of talking to God. The place of intercession, the place of you know the return of God, God, yeah, all of that. Jesus coming back. What in the world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's so many things I'm excited to part to talk to you about a lot. Like so many things. Like I'm, I, I want to help un, un, unleash this. Not unleash it, but unveil some of the truths that have changed my life. Yeah. And I am so. I've told this to Mike Bickle several times. Your teaching has changed my life, and etern- my eternal life's going to be different because of it. Hundred percent, hundred percent. But um, we, long story short, what you know, um, we did so many cool things. I I was the director of the One Thing Conference in Kansas City from kind of its its initial years, and we did it for nine years. And there's so many things I loved about all of that season. Um, but I had a little crisis again, Dwayne in his crisis, mm-hmm. and that began to transition us um, where I began to focus more internationally. Mm-hmm. And in 2011, 2012, we feel this shifting. 
Right. And it's like, oh, we've been here before. Oh, right. my gosh, what's right. happening? Right. That was a crazy season. You know, and again, just there's so many things that have this whole roots theme in it. Yep. And Jennifer and I were praying. We feel like God's doing something. And she has a picture where God is lifting up our lives and there's roots that are dangling. We were like a plant in his hand and the roots were dangling between God's fingers. And, that's, and then he moved us and planted us somewhere and else. And so to our complete surprise, no planning, we moved to uh, Florianopolis, Brazil. Yeah. So this was 2013. Our kids are now teenagers. Elijah was 10. 10, 13, and 16. And we moved there and our goal is to build a praying church. Yep. And the first year was just settling in. We did prayer meetings and we started the church of when was it? When did we start? April, May mm -hmm. of 20? April. April 2014, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that, again, this is just, my gosh, what a what in the world? We're living in Brazil now. Where did all this come <laughs> from? What does this all look like? But right. it was amazing. And so we moved there yeah. and um, the Lord breathed on it. Yeah. Um, and things really grew there yeah. and it's amazing for being a foreigner going to a new country. Um, we did everything that the books tell yeah. you not to do. I mean, we had don't no, move with, totally. the teen, with yeah, teenagers. Absolutely. Don't do that. Don't It'll do ruin that. your family. Don't move in your forties. I mean, all the, of these, things. all of these things. And also just even, we were not very conventional in how we started, how we planted, right? but, um, what I was just going to say over that season, so we were there for six years. There's a lot to say there. The, we'll hit it more. Absolutely. For sure. But it's one of those things where God breathes on something, uh -huh. but yet it is incredibly challenging. Very. And again, the Lord, but I, you know, I love what's going on there today. It's unbelievable. It still exists. It's thriving. It, it's, you know, Vinny and Emmy are, are the leaders there and it's, it's powerful. Yeah. Um, and so... But again, you know, this is, we had made a 10 year commitment and because right. we knew it was going to be hard right. and we knew it was going to be challenging. And so you make this commitment and you're going, I'm just, the Lord hasn't, and it's going to take us this long to get it going. And so we made that commitment. And then just another one of those things where the Lord surprised us. Right. And we had no plans on moving back. Um, to the states, no plans whatsoever. But this is now we've done this twice. Gone yeah. to an international field. We spent ten years basically in Europe, and then uh, six years in Brazil. And so fifteen in Kansas City. So yeah. twenty. So January of twenty nineteen. We're just going to take a break. Um, we just wanted to come back and spend three months in in um, in the states. We went to Florida. An amazing group of people. Um, in Fort Pierce, Florida, hosted us with incredible love towards Generosity. our family, overwhelmed us. Yeah. And all of a sudden, oh my gosh, God starts talking. Jennifer and I go on a fast and boom, before we know it, we've made the decision. We're, we're, trans, we're, we're transitioning back to the States. Back to the States. And it, again, it wasn't anywhere in our plans, but the Lord just kind of broke in. Yeah. And, you know, third in that season, it was, you know, just not long ago. No, nope, not know. long ago at all. And and so I would say this, just kind of as we begin to wind things down here, the, the, the model of missionaries and a house of prayer, I've been a part of it twice. Yeah. So have you. You were yeah. there. Thanks. Thanks for including <laughs> me in your resume. So, but... The thing that we were wrestling with is this is not, it's so challenging to sustain this. Yeah. And then way more than that, you can't reproduce this. And that's the thing that I was staring at. What do you mean reproduce it? It's so challenging to build a house of prayer. And it's it, it'll cost you everything. And then it's so demanding. Yeah. And so it is an, a local church can't do a house of prayer successfully very well. It's, it's hard. And so the transition in all of that, what was so um, attractive to us to the upper room in, in what the Lord is doing with the upper room right now, what attracted us was, the, for lack of a better term, the model of doing a prayer room um, around prayer in the context of 
what does it look like to be a local church? Uh huh. And the rhythm of just normal people participating, not full time. Yeah, not full time. Uh-huh. You know, we use the term intercessory missionary. So that's what attracted us. And so January, February, mm-hmm. March 2019, we're talking with the Lord. What in the world? You're moving right. us back. We have no place to go. Right, right. But let me just interject this because I want to, I don't want this to go down to history that we don't believe in the house of prayer. Um, right, the, right. Because right. there, I believe there'll probably probably will be more mission based centers of the House of Prayer around the globe. Yeah. But it is for the average church, it is just challenging. Yes. And I think when the Lord says, "My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations," that He's going to turn local churches into praying churches which will be more reproducible, more sustainable, but not to say what Mike Bickle has done, what Billy Humphrey has done, what we did, what other people have done and are doing is wrong at all. No, that's where, yeah, you don't need to correct me all the time, but that time I appreciate it. That was so necessary to be corrected, Dwayne. (laughs) I appreciated it that time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that time. Um, No, without a doubt. But I I do believe that twenty, if 2020 would tell us anything... That God is changing things. Yeah. Things are changing. And one of the more significant things that is changing, I think, one of them, not the thing, but that the church is going to understand her calling to be before the Lord. I agree. And it is not for the elite. It is not for those that are only called to prayer. It's for the body of Christ. And so that's... That was where we won't go into all the details of how it was kind of a long journey of just us, but we have went to visit Upper Room Dallas and and really when you just in the service just enjoyed it, touched us deeply. I I mean I was in tears just even that that first Sunday that we went there as a couple, and uh, the Lord touched us deeply and I saw within Upper Room such a sincere desire to minister to the Lord. Yeah. And it was very attractive. Yeah. And so to make a really, it was quite a long story. Just as we built relationship, um, they they needed a a, a campus pastor right. in Denver. And so, long story short, we transitioned to Denver. August twelfth. August twelfth of last of twenty nineteen. Yeah. And so, um, you know, as we just kind of bring this into an end, I'm just you know the the. The conversation that Jesus has with his disciples, John 15, that conversation that is recorded is is a call to be fruitful so that you will glorify the Father. Right. And it is, you know, as we mentioned, it's been a driving passion of force of mine to be fruitful. Yeah. This has been my, I want impact. Yeah. That's always been a very important part of my makeup. And we've had fruit and then we've had pruning. Yeah. We've had the both. Yeah. And the Lord's breathed on some things we've been a part of. And then also there's been seasons of what in the world is going on. Right. God, I surrender if there's any offensive way, you know. And so we've been in both seasons. And yeah. so we look forward to, to just talking about that, helping you gain clarity on perhaps what season are you in. Yeah. But we just want you to be a part of this journey that we're building with yeah. with this podcast. And I, I, I actually the way the Lord laid it up, I know that we're supposed to be doing this. Yeah, I agree. And uh, and so um, we just want to wrap it up by saying thank you for listening to this podcast. There's many, many, many more to come. Yeah. We're going to be doing this for a while, and uh, I'm excited about it. Any parting words, Jennifer? No, Dwayne, I think you are phenomenal. Your words are a gift to me and now to the body of Christ <laughs> woo, 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 woo. and to the internet. Come on, church. <laughs> Amen. So thanks for listening. Um, tune in. We'll be, uh, we'll be re- releasing some more soon. But uh, God bless you guys. Thanks for listening. Yeah, ciao, thanks. ciao.